Greetings and welcome all to another segment of Let's Talk and Grow with Ms. Rushumba. First, I give honor to our Creator, for which all things are and will forever be in this vast universe that we dwell in. Secondly, my inspiration for this show was due in part by my dearly transcendent friend, Mr. Early Laverne, who transcended in 2013. Uh, Mr. Laverne, I helped him publish his first book, A Rainbow of Poems. And it is there our friendship took root. A friend, a poet, an inspiration, his life reflects the intense struggle we often face as we navigate our lives in this system of our inheritance. I will begin with one of his amazing poems, For I Am My Brother's Keeper. Today's poem is called My Reflection by Early Laverne. As if now I shall avail to you the right direction, I am addicted toward granting complete love and affection. God is number one receiver, the very first and foremost. I award you, Supreme Father, with a spiritual toast. I need daily your divine protection. You're the main source of my reflection. Being one with you, I cannot fail. Your supreme compassion shall forever prevail. That a profound image of me is concealed within you. That is why I can share the honest truth. My clarity of life has been well understood. I will continue to do the best that I could. All human beings are deserving of my sacred heart. This knowledge I've known from the very start. In knowing that I'm a production of your fine works of art, my deep respect for you shall never depart. The amazing thing about my reflection, countless good deeds have my personal selection. Supreme Father, I salute your lovable son. His many sacrifices have made him the glorious one. By early Laverne, Asheo. All right, all right, moving right along. As you know, at the very end, I will do one of my poems from my book, Truth and Light Are One, Poetic Soul Food. But just a brief pause to say, uh, I'm reminding you, if you haven't yet, subscribe, thumbs up, and please share with those that you think would benefit from what I'm doing here today. <laughs> Okay, okay, you know, ladies and gentlemen, my YouTube faithful followers, I greet you with humility and much anticipated and excitement. For this day is gifted in more ways than one. The show I've been gifted to host, Let's Talk and Grow with Miss Roshumba, has made each guest the star of the story. For I know that we all have a history on this journey that's worth sharing. That said, I have a special treat for you all this day. For history is the mystery in time unfolded. For when we search the past, it allows us to address the present from a clearer lens, allowing our future to be realized in a progressive way. My guest today is a well-known historian, scholar, professor, author of several books. He's well-known research of Kemet, also known Egypt, on the banishing evidence of our Nile Valley. Uh, his belief is that we must know our unique heritage and the legacy that forms our Africanness. For daily, it is vanishing away to be replaced by impostures. I've been a firm believer that who controls the past controls the present, and who controls the present controls the future. I know you see an empty seat here, but now I'm about to fill it. So without further ado, I bring you our star. <laughs> uh, 
Yes, Professor Mainu Ampin. Professor Mainu Ampin is the star of today's show. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, it's my pleasure. My Thank pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us and saying yes. Professor, for showing your community that all you are, thank you so much, very much, for showing our community that although you are very busy and an honoree in our community and respected in many areas of education, you made time for we, therefore me. Welcome. I appreciate it. Well, that's, that's what it's about. You know, busy people make time for what they value. That's right. That's, that's the principle of leadership. That's correct. Thank you for that and you show up every time. You know, I had a chance to watch you, uh, some of your videos over the years, um, but one in particular I recently watched that that made it very clear of what you just said, that, you know, you make time for those that are necessary that will benefit from what you have to share. Very much so. So I'm gonna start with some questions that I've written down just to be able to stay on point and not be distracted and go in different direction. And um, the first one I have, Professor Ampim, please tell the audience that are not familiar with you as to who you are, especially the younger generation that needs to know you and one day your legacy that they may have to possibly continue? Well, you know, I appreciate the question because it helps to contextualize um, my presence here with you today. And I'm a primary researcher and historian, and I've been doing work in the trenches now for more than three decades. Mm -hmm. So I started in the 1980s to really begin to learn about the best of African culture and tradition. And I decided that it wasn't enough just to read books. Right. That's a good start, but I wanted to do primary or firsthand research. So I dedicated my professional career, my life's work to do original first-hand research in museums, institutes, libraries, uh, also out in the field at pyramid sites, temple sites, mm -hmm. tomb sites, and ancient residential sites to go beyond just general knowledge to be an actual specialist because clearly we suffer from historical amnesia and the serious connected historian has to not just be in the ivory tower talking to other colleagues, mm -hmm. but to be out in the community to help to uh, shape and mold our understanding because we certainly cannot understand today or move forward in the future unless we have a thorough grounding in the past. So my mm -hmm. work has been not only in academia, but in the community to make sure that we don't continue to, to suffer from uh, historical amnesia. Historical amnesia, wow. Because what's the effects of uh, suffering from historical amnesia, would you say? It's black folks not having any connection, thinking they have no connection to Africa. They will often say, I ain't no African. And people think that there's some great gulf in dis distance. I say, well, you know, your genes choose before you do. Mm. You can say anything you want to, your genes is already chosen. You look African to me, mm. and so I said, in fact, your, your digestive system doesn't agree with you because, uh, you know, black folks in the U.S. are generally lactose intolerant. Mm -hmm because that's the tradition we come from in West Africa. So our genes and our biological structure has chosen our makeup before right, we do. Right. People have ideological um, disorientation. Right. So this is why folks have little tolerance for those that look like us and mm -hmm. are part of, our, uh, of their own tradition. Mm -hmm. So we see the, um, you know, the remnants of right. uh, lack of self-knowledge and, and self-hate. So this is, this, is, this is quite prominent right, for us. Right. We got a lot of work to do to connect us back to our tradition. It's not just going back to the old days just right. for the nostalgia, no. It's to look at principles and practices that allowed Africans to be great. Correct. We take those principles and practices. We're not just trying to build a new pyramid structure here in California mm -hmm. or any other place in mm -hmm. the country. We're looking at those principles that allow mm -hmm. the greats to build those, those, those um, monuments that still confound the world and mm -hmm. take those principles and reapply them today mm -hmm. to solve current problems. Because the problems that we're suffering with today, uh, you know, the lack of self-knowledge, we think we gotta depend on somebody else for food, shelter, clothing, education, education and healthcare when we have worked out these challenges and problems many millennia ago. So there's no reason to be yeah. Help looking to help, looking for somebody else to help us yeah. to solve our problems makes no sense when makes we sense. have a big, a long historical view that we've been at the apex of human achievement in working out those problems. And um, 
what you said is very powerful, but when we think of the educational system that we have now, because, you know, integration changed everything for us, um, where is it that we would find the, the truth? Uh, I mean, that's why sometimes I, I lean towards reading because my historical background is from well-chosen books. Um, being a busy mom over the years and the roles I've had, I had not had the opportunity to do the universities in the traditional sense. Um, and But I spend time reading because I think it's important to know what has happened. So for those that saying that, yeah, I feel strong when I, you know, move on the basketball court and when I do certain things in life, I, I could see that I stand out physically from the rest. But how do they get that information that puts it in here that makes them, you know, solid to, to don't ask for power, but take the power and take their rightful place in society? Yeah, that's an important question. You know, those who are grounded in our tradition and culture, I mean, they walk differently. Yeah. They act differently. They're shaped differently. They're molded differently. So I just came back from another educational tour to Kemet yeah. uh, just uh, two months ago. And Kemet is Egypt, That, if you didn't know. That's the other name. That's the name they've told us, but the true name is Kemet. Kemet, absolutely. And I say that if, if people have the right experience, they don't really need a round trip international ticket. They just need a one-way ticket and they fly back on enthusiasm and excitement alone. <laughs> and there's been some people who didn't need that round trip yeah. ticket and they walk differently. I've seen people completely make changes. Those that had no confidence, they come back now teaching. Yes. Teaching not just children, but other adults yeah. and standing tall in the community to make contributions that they weren't clear that they could make in the before that time. But when they can see the ancestral legacy, then there's no doubt there's no uh, hesitation or reservation. People stand up and they make contributions that right. they weren't sure that they can make before the emerging, yeah. the, the immersion, because it's really a pilgrimage. Yes. You know, not just to see, as somebody uh, foolishly said, to see dead rocks. It's not about dead rocks. Mm -hmm. It's about remains of the ancestors mm. that still loom in majesty. Yes. And so, um, you know, that's what's important is yes. for people to be connected to their history and heritage. And as the great Kwame Ture said, that if you start your history in slavery, right. the best you can be is a good slave. Mm. And this is where most people are stuck, you know, that they're just descendants of slaves. And so when we have African Heritage Month, the so-called Black History Month, 90% of the people, they want to deal with slavery yeah. and afterwards. Yes, it has a place, but what, yeah. what about the much longer right. period in our history? Right. And besides, February shouldn't be some time period where we focus on how somebody handed up behind to us on a platter, mm -hmm. how someone was a slave and mm -hmm. we escaped from slavery. None of that. It's about achievements, contributions and uh, you know, and uh and uh and accomplishments, accomplishments in the world. Correct. In fact, even the great Carter G. Woodson criticized those people who only want to talk about black folks and something negative. Right. In fact I told the people at the college, don't ever do that again. Yeah. They they promoted something where somebody uh he Apparently, he got some white nationalists, some mm -hmm. white supremacists, mm -hmm. bigots, to leave the Klan. So how, the hell, no. so how the hell does this become a event mm -hmm. during February? I said, don't ever do that That's again. Correct. But so let me teach you something. Right, right. So we will only endorse e events that are about us and about something positive and constructive, our accomplishments, our achievements. That's That's, we don't deal with these kind of negatives, so right. don't ever do that again. And, uh, and take that off the website yeah. before I rise up yeah. and, and deal with you. You know, I, I love how you've approached it in, in that direction because, you know, the scars are already in our spirit. That's why we're asking the question and trying to find out who we are and our relevance to our great continent. Um, and what you've said has made it uh, a question like recently, you know, in the educational system, the polit po political party, you know, have said, you know, no ra no critical race theory in the schools being taught. <laughs> you know, they're, they're using that critical race theory, like well, let's omit certain things that we share with the, the people of African descent because it makes us uncomfortable, meaning they. And um, so when I heard that, I thought, oh, okay. So you're doing it because you, you want to be comfortable. And but what you've just said here kind of addresses it. You know, we could talk from the greatness that we've accomplished. Would that make they, them uncomfortable? <laughs> yeah. 
when we speak from, you know, let, let's, let's forget about That's slavery right. and talking about it. We all know about it. We don't really need to wallow in that anymore. Now we really just want to talk about our greatness, the pyramids, you know, the things that we've put together that still is, what we've done here in this country. And, Point. And, you know, when my son, who is going to be 23 this year, when he was uh, in first grade, second grade, he was the only African-American child in the class. And he was brilliant because he has a mother like me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, when he went to school, I understood that ac academia, he could pass with no problem, but there was going to be a social imbalance in him. So I made it a point to create these boards coming from the direction that you spoke, you know, a moment ago, these boards that would tell the history, and I did them in a trilogy set, you know, who are the Africans was the first board, fine tuning, she's talking about Mali Empire, Song He, and so forth, with back information on it, and the second board, 400 years of enslavement, I wanted to show that that existed, and the third board, renew and revive. So over the years, I would do that at Black History Time, make three boards, take them to the school so they could remember this child and he could feel good that his information is shown. So, you know, to know who we are is what's going to make us act different, stand up straight, and not take certain things that are being fed to us. Because we prove that we're a survivor being here in this country and not have been extinct. Absolutely. Well, you know, self-knowledge is the basis of true knowledge. You can't really know any, anything <clears throat> in any detail unless you know yourself because we have to center ourselves mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in the environment and in the society so that, but it's also not a, it, you know, it's also a historical centering. So right. self-knowledge is the absolute true foundation for self-knowledge. And that's important for people to know essentially who they are. And it's, a, it's interesting that as a professional historian, one of the things I notice is that most people are excited about their family history. Yes. And you have people with no training, all of a sudden they become genealogical madmen and women. They're just <laughs> driven to find out more about their yes. family. Yes. So they instinctively know the importance Important. of uh, their genealogy right. and their personal family legacy. Right. And this is something that people across the board, whether yeah. they're African descent or not, Correct. they get excited about That's it because right. it's an innate, um, interest in knowing who we are and what our centeredness is. And we have to discover that uh, more widely among black folks so we can right. act differently, walk differently, and achieve differently. Right. And so once we have built that self-understanding, uh, the, the hard part is when we live in a system, and I always tend to say this, that has a narrative that has written us out of it and put us in there as objects. Very much. And in this kind of a system, how does one, you know, really go about on purpose, you know, finding and searching those truths? Because mm -hmm. one of the first things I've realized being a mother, and I'm also a grandmother, um, is the system, the educational system that we currently have, in order for someone to be great, they have to purposely dumb down <laughs> the African people. Yeah. And I found that they've, that has been precisionly applied, especially to the black male. Just hand them a ball and tell them that you're going to be like a great ball player of either football, baseball, basketball, or something. And let you forget the fact that you, what you have in this motor right here. You know, so can you speak to that? in a sense yeah. as to where would you know once we it's almost like one lecture that you said you know we lecture we talk but now how do we organize to make those objectives positive make them a reality yes reality. The purpose, yes that's exactly the purpose of study is to clarify the work that has to be done but for the we're reading and, and studying for the sake of just having information without actualization is useless it right. always has been right but you know, for me, and the reason why I not only teach at the college level and taught in community schools, independent schools, and work and teach in the yeah. community is it's my mission in life, but I've also recognized that we have to share the insight with the people in various modes, right. modalities, whether it is in the classroom or writing books. Right. So my latest book, A History of African Civilizations, I decided to take that information out of the classroom, yeah. what I'm teaching students, 
to make it available to the community. And one of the fundamental tasks that I've had for decades now is to make sure, as you were just referring to, mm -hmm. that we're not the the um, we're not the object of somebody else's contempt, and right. that we embrace and buy into that. But we're the subject of our own experience. Exactly. So the key is always to make us the subject of our experience and give us an insight to to African culture and tradition. Right. And uh, as opposed to how the outsiders look at it, right. the outsiders always look at us as an object of contempt to be minimized, to be belittled and dismissed as opposed to a, you know, the subject. And so once we become the subject, then we're able to have an inside view of mm -hmm. our own reality, mm -hmm. you know. And so, you know, the outsiders write a whole bunch of nonsense that makes no sense if you have an inside view and perspective. And so that's why doing the work out in the field, right. it's a completely different perspective. I remember reading one Mickey Mouse article in a mainstream newspaper said that the husband, this is in East Africa, the husband had passed away mm -hmm. and the wife was still in the household. So the brother, according to the Mickey Mouse article, the brother had to come and sleep with the wife. Uh, no, that's how the, the, that's how the mainstream uh, idiots Mm -hmm. Right against African culture. Look, no, he's not sleeping with the wife. He's sleeping in the house with the wife and family to replace his brother. Yes, that's you know. But the tradition. low level outsider right. cannot see a man in the house sleeping without having sexual relations with the woman. That's mm -hmm. a little Mickey Mouse article that knows nothing about the traditional mm -hmm. culture. This is why we survived so well in the U.S. Yes, even if the historical opponent sold off a mother or a father, it didn't matter right. in the sense that other people in that community stepped up and played the role of mother and father. Correct. You know, whether they were the biological mother and father or not. That's why growing up in our community, it's dying out now, yeah. but even when I grew up in San yeah. Francisco, everybody was aunt, so we had Aunt Gladys, Uncle yes. Choo Choo. I wasn't, I was much older when I recognized they were not a so-called really relative, <laughs> yeah. but they played the role of aunt and uncle. Exactly. You know, and they could guide us, discipline us, yeah. just like our parents That's would. Correct. Now those days are going, you ain't my daddy, yes. you know, and they want it, and the daddy comes, they want to fight and beat somebody down. But we've lost our way. Mm -hmm. So in a situation like us, that, that we're in, people of African descent, either we never had a way and we've always been lost and depending on other people for food, shelter, clothing, and everything else, or we had a way and we lost our way. Mm -hmm. That's our situation. Mm -hmm. We had a way and we lost we our lost way. It. And we regain the knowledge of that way when we look at it from an inside perspective, right. where we're the subject of our experience and not simply buying into what outsiders' mm -hmm. perceptions mm -hmm. are about what African culture is about. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's what it's really about. And to give the viewer or the reader or the student that inside view yes. that they're not gonna get from the outside sources. And not only the, the books that are that are half-baked at best, right. but also the what I would consider the docudramas. They're not documentary, they're docudramas that people see on the History Channel, uh, Discovery Channel, mm -hmm. National Geographic, mm -hmm. or even the museum exhibits mm. that completely misrepresent the culture, whether it's the Queen Hatshepsut exhibit mm -hmm. that was in the area, the King Tutankhamen exhibit, mm -hmm. or the current Ramses the Great exhibit. Mm. People are excited about that, so hold on, they're making a lot of money, 35 to 40 dollars for each adult and twenty five dollars for students, regardless of age, wow. they're making money, uh, and they're misrepresented at the same time because we can't. We can go and check it out as an analyst, yes. but don't go and suck all that stuff in right. because it's based on outside propaganda, right. you know, as opposed to inside knowledge. They don't consult with black specialists on these because they don't think they have to. So that's really what it's about: flipping yeah. the script and make sure that we always have an inside view as the subject and not as an object mm. uh, of somebody else's uh, contempt. And I thank you for sharing that. And it brings me back again to when my son was small and, you know, I would take him to the zoo. You know, I, I wanted him to not see himself as a um, subjugated individual that everyone has something and you are just there, just like the object. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I remember taking him to the zoo and almost every animal we came to, I would say, and this one is from Africa and that one is from Africa. And, you know, and it was like, everything was from Africa. And I felt so proud to say it out loud that where, they, where it came from and made him feel good and others look at him. So we have so much to be proud of. Even our being, being here, has made a country very wealthy. 
And, you know, sometimes I say when you know who you are, you know this country has been, has survived because of us. And, and it also speaks to that we have survived because of us. Because we, we went to a tragic time, and although we will not spend much time just talking about that period, but the fact that we went through it and arise from it made us a jewel now. Yeah. You see, so I, I love how you say, let's celebrate that we have arrived here, and now let's look at why. Let's look at the, 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 the genius of our background that makes us still here as a people and not extinct mm -hmm. so um I, I i i'm enjoying this conversation mm -hmm. wholeheartedly yeah. <laughs> you know and I, and I think it's so important um some of the things that come to my mind is um sometimes you know when we start to when we have those leaders in our community um some of the problems that we run into is the naivety of our, 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 our people that cannot see the bigger picture, they start to self-sabotage our community by some of the things that, you know, they do. They first say, well, you're a woman, you can't be the leader. You're too dark, you can't be the leader. You don't have a degree, you can't be the leader. You know, so what is it that we should start looking at because if we use somebody else's narrative, then it's going to be, you have to be light-skinned, you have to have several degrees, and you have to have, uh, you have to be a male, and you have to, you know, show wealth. <laughs> so what, what's your take on that? Because, you know, we have to be careful that we, we have swallowed the pill of the same people that brought us here. I'm kind of warm if you see I'm doing this, you know. That's why I call this ground rules. This is our narrative. We're doing it our way. So go ahead and tell me, answer that question. Well, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely correct. I mean, it's been what's been presented and promoted and people dying on images mm -hmm. uh, on a regular basis and they don't know what hits them. So like in one of my classes, we uh, I teach everything. You know, African okay. civilizations, that's my work, you know, uh, in the field. But it's not only African civilizations, but world history in mm. general, and uh, also U.S. history, yes. and uh, and also the African American experience. Okay. But one of the U.S. history classes, when we look, when we when we start looking at the twenty the early twentieth century yes. and the development of Hollywood yes. uh, in the movie industry, coming out of places like L.A., then I share with the students that they should be very clear that movies are not simply about entertainment. Right. It's about the transmission of values. And that's important to know. And Pause. So transmission of values is what we get when we watch a movie. Somebody's value being transmitted to you. And especially if you're hungry and you feel empty and you feel voided, like I, I don't matter. So you are measuring yourself against those that are transferring that message to you. That's exactly what it is. And we saw that prominently in the black exploitation era of the early 70s, where just because a black person was on the, the big screen for the first time, people bought these images and, mm -hmm. and, and low level bad values that were anti community. Mm. This is the first time we saw these images of pimps and hustlers and right. pink Cadillacs and drugs being introduced in the community. Even 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 Blackula had to be black, mm. you know, and uh, but that's when we saw the gangster images for the very first time, and so uh, this is when we begin to internalize this. But as you mentioned before, integration, this was not a part of our community. We did not have gangs. Right. If we're talking about 20th century, we didn't have gangs. Right. We didn't have this this uh, outrageous um, conflict between generations, elders and others. Right. And But the colorism has continued to increase because we bought into the values of others. Right. That's why when I take people out in the field uh, to Kemet, mm -hmm. uh, so-called Egypt, we make sure that there's an emphasis on the prominent role of women. And uh, women, first of all, the, the throne was passed from mother to daughter. Mm -hmm. And so when people see, well, wait a minute, he married his sister. Yes, he married his sister. That's a political marriage. Because no king had a legitimate, he was not a legitimate king or ruler unless he married his sister symbolically. Because right. they, the women represented the throne and leadership and rulership. 
And so he could not be legitimate. Not only that, what's also important is that over every coronation ceremony was the mother. She's the one that provided. Right. And in many, and you don't even see the father in the scene. You see the mother, Correct. usually with the symbols of authority, could be the sister or other symbols presiding over the ceremony as a person mm. receives his crown. And you don't see the father. Mm. In fact, in a lot of the texts, you don't see, or we, we don't read the name of the father. Not that fathers weren't around. Right. They just did not have the same importance of the mother. As the mother. You know, and that's not only in Kemet. We can go south to Sudan Correct. and Kush. And you have the illustrious rulers such as uh, Taharka and others. Right. Taharka, Taharka could not be installed unless he sent for his mother hundreds of miles in the south. Wow. So she had to go all the way north to uh, Minnefer, or so-called Memphis, yeah. to, to preside over the ceremony. And we see that throughout the Nile Valley, yeah. the prominent role of women. So this, this nonsense that women had no role right. or were less than, that's a Greek and Roman and, Euro, and European an Indo-European reality. Exactly. They still think that way. Yeah. Ne never once yeah. has that been a part of the African right. reality. Right. Even now, among the indigenous communities, the small stature people, even now, you don't find any any lesser role than women. Their role is just as important as the yeah. male. So this gender problem that we have now of uh, not having respect for the women and the color issue, these are all modern issues that, modern are, not, issues. that are not up for debate and discussion. Yeah. That's why I say that documentation beats conversation every day of the week. So people can talk all they want, doesn't make any difference. What about the documentation? What is the documentation? And it's clear that Africans were at a much higher level thousands of years before the folks who are currently in charge knew anything about, about uh, social equality and having a harmonious, um, egalitarian society. Well, in fact, we had no ranks at all, right. no chiefs, no kings, and right. no small statue communities that are still around today, right. even now. So we don't have to say well, how it was, only we look at even now. Yeah. We look at the Ife, the Mbuti, those in these isolated areas, the small statue people still, you have these uh, tremendous egalitarian right. communal societies where women have played an important role so whether we look at that or africa at its apex of achievement you still find the mm -hmm. the high level status of women mm -hmm. people might know about queen hatchup mm -hmm. but she comes from a line of female rulers right. and uh and her reign was so powerful going back about 3500 years ago and the reason why people may know more about her is because no one can put a sheet over those monuments that were built with granite can't put a sheet over, can't dismiss it. Mm. You know, she's erected monuments to 320 ton block of granite and has a temple uh, called Desher Desheru, the sacred of the most sacred. Wow. And when you see this three tiered structure, it looks like a modern government building. So it's very clear. And it's absolutely telling, too, that Africans were at this high level of social organization and the high status of women versus the folks in Greece and Rome where women weren't even considered citizens, right. had no rights right. whatsoever. Right. Right. And so we see this still continuing in the U.S., but that's a part of the European tradition. Yes. And it is, uh, it is destructive to follow that kind of nonsense. And finally, it's like what Franz Fanon said, yeah. we can't try to catch up with the decadence of Europe or Euro-America. We can't try to imitate and duplicate right. that kind of... Uh, right. Decadence. Right. We need to chart our own way. That's right. So that's that's what is important for us. And I thank you so much for really speaking to that, because you know I'm from the Caribbean islands. You know I've been here a long, long time, but mm -hmm. you know it, it, that's a very patriarchal area. There is the Caribbean islands, and I think they would rise much more if their their honor and respect was restored to the women. The effects on the women has been devastating. And um, it's devastating wherever we are uh, under this patriarchal system. But what you've shared with us right now has, and I hope the listeners are listening, because, you know, when you honor and respect the woman, the peace comes to the home. The children become healthy again, right. you right. know, because we're not competing for that role. Because oftentimes I, I've come to understand the role competition is because of the degradation of the black man in society. And because he cannot, you know, solidly be the man, the provider in this 
Eurocentric society, you know, that he, he kind of puffs up a little bit more at home. <laughs> Right. You know, so if you connect it, then you understand. But you're supposed to come home to love, to peace, brought to you by the woman. Huh? <laughs> come home to love, peace, the one that brings forth the life for the future, your children. So thank you for that. I, I love that. And um, so, you know... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. John Henry Clark and Dr. Amos Wilson, I know you know those names. I certainly do. <laughs> <laughs> those are some of my great teachers that I had not actually sat in their presence to, to learn from them, but you know, I'm a reader. I love to read, and so that's how, and, and, and videos, like you said, the 90s was about lecture videos that were circulating in the community. Mm -hmm. And Blueprint for Black Power, I never read that, but that's a huge book. It's a massive work by, yes. by Amos Wilson. Yes, very, much. very powerful. Now, I've read some of his books that helped me to see the greatness in my child, like Awakening the Genius in the Black Child. Powerful. You know, I didn't get that 700-page book. <laughs> I have the book, but I have not read it. But um, so knowledge of, of ourselves is important. And you say a, a lot of it, you try to get to, what would you say? Where would they search out, you know, because I hate to say it, but a lot of our youths, the system has made sure they cannot read. They're not really paying attention to who, some, some of our children. And because um, the parents are busy working you know, or just trying to just stay grounded, our youths are losing their way that way. And so transmission of history through the medium, the TV, the technological technology, mm -hmm. the, the smartphones, <laughs> those types of things have taken over our children. And then on top of it, yeah. They've thrown a dose of marijuana. Now you don't have to sneak and go and find it. You can get it anywhere. Right. So we're in for a really rugged ride, the 21st century young people, uh, wouldn't you say? Very much. You know, it's about um, parents being parents and not just the biological progenitors. So as I said earlier, pe busy people make time for what they value. Ooh. So if a parent has to work, so what? They need to step up and get other people involved to help them with their children, yes. if it is to transport them to a program yes. and pick them up from that after school program, right. which could be in the library. Right. They could be getting them in uh, after school sports so that they learn discipline and how to work in a group and team and also be confident in winning. Right. We went to the San Francisco Boys Club in San Francisco. We were confident in winning. We yes. expected to win. Yes. I have dozens and dozens and dozens of trophies yes. wow. in basketball, in pool. Uh, billiards, in ping pong, you know, uh, in track. Mm -hmm. We competed. We wanted to be the best. Mm -hmm. But we also had, uh, we learned character. We learned hard work. Right. So that, and it also kept us out of trouble, you know. Yes. Um, so we weren't around a bunch of yes. riffraff. Our yes. parents kept us involved with programs. During the summer, we went to camp for yes. two weeks. We liked it so much, we asked can we stay another two weeks. For a yes. large part of the summer, we were in Camp Mendocino yes. learning. Yes. You know, learning archery and, and horseback riding, shooting and uh, running, you know, with the Jim Thorpe games and track and things like that. So parents can't adopt the, Euro the, Euro the European Eurocentric model that they're isolated families all by themselves, right. you know? There's a lot of other families that are raising children who are the same age group. They might even be classmates. So what are you going to do as a responsible right. parent to right. make sure you bring other people right. in? as well so that's the that's one of the great fallacies is the american um this uh, nuclear family mm -hmm. where it's, it's the great emphasis on individualism mm -hmm. people are cut off from the community yes and so they think they got to do everything themselves and, mm -hmm. and and because they think that way there's not as much investment with the with the children with the children you know and, exactly. and they suffer because teaching at independent schools i can see it I can see parents coming in struggling, yes. not just financially, but no investment. Right. I told one of the young brothers, right. uh, Malik, uh, Malik was like 12 right. and no skills. His skills were like a seven-year-old. Wow. Here's what I told Malik. I said, brother, uh, don't, take this, uh, don't take this the wrong way. Right. 
but we have a morning recess yes. and then and there's lunch and so forth. I said, uh, you're not going to have a morning recess. And it's not a penalty against you, but you're behind the other students. It's not your fault. Right. How are you going to catch up? you got to spend more time. That's correct. So your morning recess is you're going to be here with me. Mm. We're going to be working on extra lessons. And so, uh, you know, you can get the lunch, but you better do the work to earn the lunch. That's where I'm at. That's correct. So That's we, right. So, so we, uh, people can say what they want to say. I told We told the parents right. that um, they need to do the homework. Right. And uh, otherwise, it's going to be a long day. So okay. make sure they eat a big breakfast. Correct. Lunch is optional. That's it, right. It will be earned. That's right. And so Malik, he began to understand. But I said, you know, I told Tiffany the same thing. Yes. That you're not going to have an early break till we can catch you up. Because right. they couldn't read. Um, you have 12, 13-year-olds counting on their fingers. Correct. As opposed to having the ability to do mental Correct. math. So I'm not going to allow that. And guess what? That kind of approach within two months, they're... they're they're able to do mental math. That's They're not right. counting on their That's fingers right. anymore. I told and, and teach the youth that the best calculator is the six inches between your ears. That's correct. And we tell the parents that uh, this is how we're doing things. Yes. So you, whatever happens at home, um, whatever the circumstances is, your child is way behind. Right. And that's not going to continue in our area, that's in our correct. arena. So, so you stay in your lane and you let us do our work. That's correct. And you will see what will. And I remember, well, you know, I can go on and on. I remember one parent was shocked. I did a summer session, but she couldn't get her son to do anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the first two days, he was doing his work diligently. She said, how did you do that? I said, you the mama. Mm -hmm. You're going to feed him and do all this stuff, give him things he wants anyway. For me, everything has to be earned. Mm -hmm. And when he knows everything is earned, guess what? He's going to step up, and I'm pulling out potential that's already there. And he knew that he had to earn mm -hmm. all the things. So you want breaks and things like that, you earn it. Mm -hmm. The next thing you know, he's doing, I knew he can do that. Of course. You know what I mean? They, they, came, they come to us as genius. Absolutely. What we basically do is pass down our brokenness to them and Absolutely. nurture it. And, and, and whatever we are insecure about, we ref, def, def, reflect it on them. Always. Absolute always. And that's what that generational so-called curse is about. It's passing our innate, innate pain on to the next generation. And oftentimes when you realize it, you come to be an elder and you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, so that's why we really need the community. That's why we need teachers that look like we to teach our children that sees that. Because when you have that and then you're working and maybe you're a single parent and economics and society is always pressuring you, you know, it makes you wonder how we even remain here. Absolutely. And we, you know, and, and it's always great when we get the feedback. Yes. Later on. Some yes. of you understand it at the time. Others yes. have to mature. Right. And it's not even at a young age only. You know if you're doing a good job if, let's say, at the college level, you have students that are you know, uh, beginning college age, late teens, mm -hmm. 20s, 30s, mm -hmm. 40s. You have some older, there's grandparents. Yes. And it's how they respond to you after the semester ends. The grades are in. That's right. So there's nothing to gain by by talking rubbish that doesn't matter. Right. But when they follow you on social media and they come <laughs> back to say thank you and they, uh, you know, and they go like they go with me on my educational tours. Right. They've already finished at the college oh, wow. years earlier, you know, or they come around and want to see what they can do to help yeah. or just sit in so they can learn more about the process. Or they come back for career advice, which happens all the time. All the time. Then you know it has nothing to do with a grade. That's These right. are people that remember you, right. they're influenced by you, and they know that they can get the right insight and guidance. Mm -hmm. Because the fact is that very few of us remember our grade school teachers. Exactly. We, we remember the ones that typically had a positive impact or somebody that was negatively That's outrageous. Right. We remember them too. Yeah, but exactly. other than that, we don't remember most of them because exactly. they made no real impact. Exactly. You know, and even me, I, it's a certain yeah. certain teachers that I remember yes. from fourth grade right. and, you know, fifth grade. But most, I don't even remember. If you said their name, I wouldn't remember exactly. because they made no impact. But I do remember those that had no confidence that I could achieve anything. Mm -hmm. I do remember outrageous principles that felt that since we were from the hood right. that we were automatically causing trouble in the right. yard. No, that conflict was not because of where we right. were from. That conflict happened because uh, this person over here 
kicked the ball, threw a ball, even if it was accidental, all I know is it hit me in the back of the head right. and somebody better apologize. That's correct. That's how it works. That's right. But the anti-black principal right. at our elementary school figured that we were troublemakers and we were going to be suspended. But guess mm -hmm. what? Mother and father said, none of that's going to happen. That's correct. I'm taking off work right now. You ain't suspending my child. You need to find out what happened. That's correct. So I, I, I remember those things. Yes. Very much yes. so. And wow. I think that the parents cannot buy into the Eurocentric individualism. It has to reach out to the community for other parents that have the same mm -hmm. experience, mm -hmm. the same values and needs mm -hmm. and, and form networks mm -hmm. to support each other. It happens, but not often not enough. Not often enough. And that lack of often enough sometimes comes from, sometimes I would say, not understanding our oneness as a people. You know, because no one group, no one family could do it alone. We need Correct. each other. Correct. We need each other, but not in a competitive level. And, you know, as you were speaking, I, I even, you know, we could go on forever, as you can tell. And I know a lot of folks say her videos are so long. So, but I do want to say something that is really important, especially to speak to it, is what is happening in the community with our young men. And that, you know, they're afraid of each other and they're all now strapped and ready to take each other out. Like, yeah. you know, that that is so dangerous, you know, that they um, are really believe the enemy looks like them. Yes, they're convinced of it. They're convinced of it. To show you where, where we are. And, you know, and I say the historian has an advantage because we have the long view. Yes. We can look at these issues and trends over time, over generations right. and century, and not only the here and now. And um, so that's what I'm glad I'm able to do, yes. is to really look at the, the whole picture. Right. But um, some of the viewers are going to be familiar with Million Man March. Correct. And people were very, very excited about that in 1995. Right. To me, it was a problem. Mm. Immediately, we have hundreds of thousands, a million black men going to D.C., to learn what they should be doing in the community. Mm. To me, it never made any sense. Why would you have to go out of state, out of town, to hear from other brothers about what you should be doing when you see the problems in your own neighborhood, right. in your own city? Okay. I can see you going to learn how to better address the issues, but most of them were not involved in any program mm. or any process, any organization at all and they got to go to D.C. to be inspired and then go back home and do what they should have been doing in the first place. Mm. So you think those follow-up programs lasted? Of course not. Mm -mm. Because black folks sometimes, hear me well, folks, think that we got to go. My, my mentor would always say we're big event people, that we have to go to the big event to get inspired. Mm. Real organizers don't go to the big event to be inspired. Real organizers go to the big event to further the work that they're already doing. You don't go to the big event to get inspired and then go back home and do what you know you should have been doing in the first place. Most of folks could never deny that there were problems right in their own neighborhood. Mm -hmm. The question is, what are you doing about it? Exactly. Let me go to D.C. and be inspired by speeches and right, lectures. Right. That made no sense whatsoever. You're going to spend all that money and give it to the airlines and the hotels and the restaurants and you didn't invest anything in your own community that you live in and you know that there were problems. So it's a different perspective yeah. about organizing and being accountable. Mm -hmm. It's not about the big event, it's about doing what needs to be done. If parents don't have to join a rites of passage program, if there are those programs around to help the youth, great. If they're not, then do what you need to do. That, yeah. You know, you, you see the other parents dropping their children off, why don't you talk to them? Right, 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 right. How you all can coordinate. If you trust right. them, if they're credible people, then uh, that's what has to be done, block by block, house by house, youth by youth, and not look for the big event to help come save us. I, I, and I, I'm, I'm glad that you said that, but one thing I wonder, though, is, because you saying it now will put a aha moment in somebody's head, but I, I wonder if at that time, there, the, the, these folks, these men doubted themselves. You know, they doubted themselves as men, they doubted themselves as black men. They doubted themselves as husbands, fathers, brothers, and all of those things. So I wonder if that was their moment just to rally together and say, yeah, we could do this. And you know what I mean? So I wonder if, you know, because the trans media is constantly doing its work, making you question yourself. Well, that's, that's part of my statement. We still 
think that it's the big event that's mm -hmm. going to save us. That's the problem. Yes. Because at the time, there were white supremacist programs all over the country mm. where brothers who weren't the big time activists were joining collective efforts. So these programs like Simba, for example, or Simba Inc. Okay. And so Simba. many other programs, they're around. Right. Making a contribution, making a dent in the problem. So, so it's the will. Your yeah, will. It's, it's definitely the will, and it's also about people recognizing that they can make a contribution. Yeah. So the lack of confidence could have been addressed when people simply reach out right. and join communities that no one would yeah. possibly not know exist because yeah. the word is out there. Especially so, in the 90s. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it's a lame excuse. Yeah. For folks that are not going to do anything right, it's right. the big event we love the lecture just like the great you mentioned scholars like yeah. clark and yeah. others and amos wilson but it's also the great chancellor williams the author of destruction of black civilization read it and chancellor williams repeatedly said that we're the best when it comes to the first two steps yeah, speaking right. and meeting meeting right. and speaking speaking and meeting right. but we don't get to the third step right. of action and that's been part of our challenge yeah. is action and we've had periods in our history when there was a sufficient action right. to address problems so we can do it again. That's correct. Like right after slavery. Yes. We had the most people in the political arena than we probably ever have even now, which maybe just changing now, but then. Um, so, uh, wow. <laughs> I was going to say something, but you know, we, we're on a, a path um, and we have to, you know, really focus in and start thinking about ways that we could remain here because knowledge is power. And I believe not just knowledge of ourselves, but knowledge of who we're dealing with. Very much. You know, I study history, but recently, not recently, but over time, I, I had to ask the question, well, who are these people <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that have me playing defense <laughs> and because i want to choose to do offensive moves i said to myself well i got to get to know who they are and why they would feel it necessary to keep me in a box mm -hmm. and and have me suffer when i as a woman and as a mother want to raise my children and be the best nurturer to them and my family and I was pleasantly surprised that, not, I shouldn't even say pleasant, but I was surprised, but not surprised mm. to find that there is, it's, it's number one, all you have to do is look at the TV. You will see who they are, the violence they, they use, mm. you know, the scary movie. What does scary movie work? <laughs> You know, um, the soap operas especially. The soap operas is the, the fantasy of the world one would want to be. You know, dressed up all day. And not that I watch it now, but I remember back in the, 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 was it the 80s, Luke and Laura. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, but, you know, so those were the times where you're saying, who am I? What, am I beautiful enough? But, sure. You know, and all those things. So you start to see that they give you a vision to look at. But there's a, a book that I've read uh, that I'm currently reading now. Um, it was written in the late 30s, early 40s called The Deep South. It was a sociologist, uh, uh, anal an analytical, uh, um, anal analyzing two groups of people. The, the, the Deep South, in the Deep South was the Blacks mm -hmm. and the Whites. Who are they? How did they relate? How did their system work? You know, from the classism and caste. How does that work in the whites mm -hmm. or community and the blacks? And um, a white couple spent two years in the amongst the white folks, and the uh, a black couple did the same. And so they would document how people uh, relate to each other and you know, how they see the classism and everything. It was, it's very powerful. And I've been taking my time and eating it like a nice tasty cake just to digest it, <laughs> you know, but I'm finding out a lot more and it helps me. See, these are the, the things that feed my, my persona to allow me to step out of that box and to do my part in the community. Um, and 
you know, hopefully, because I think I'm also the star of the story. <laughs> so I'm not going to spend too much more time. Um, you know, I had some questions written, but I think we covered what we needed to in such a beautiful way. And I hope our audience finds, you know, this to be food for their thought, their, their confidence, their ability to do their best job. Um, so as I near the end, Professor Amu, Manu, um, what do you see futuristically for the descendants of the builders of this great experiment called America? the African-American. What do you see uh, as a future for us here in this country? Although I'm not, I wasn't born here, I've made it my home for many, many years. And, and we see things are changing and shifting very quickly. You know, constitutional and things are being challenged, the big lie or the big, you know, truth gone to lie. So tell me what you think, sir, on that. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, things are changing very rapidly. We've had more change in the last few decades than the entire history of the country in terms of um, you know, relations. It's been pretty extraordinary. I think for, for black people, people of African descent, um, there's more people attempting to embrace Africa because we have more opportunity, but yeah. there's also more fragmentation as well. And it's being promoted by the media. You can look at how they might present family. Right. You have maybe a uh, sister with, and, 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 you know, interracial couple, mm -hmm. interracial wow. family. Sometimes it doesn't make any sense. How could, you know, these children be the offspring of these parents? It's like, uh, they're almost like a different racial type, right. racial group. So it's, a, right. it's incongruent. So we have to fight against things that don't make any sense. Right. They really don't support um, the black family and the black community. Right. So, um, you know, in the near future, is going to be struggle, a struggle for uh, cultural and you know physical survival, and right. survival of our heritage and our history. So, but I'm I, I'm kind of inspired by Chancellor Williams, who wrote his book Destruction of Black Civilization in 1971. Right. But the subtitle was Great Issues of a Race from from 4500 BC to 2000 AD. He actually projected three decades yes. in the future. It was yes. very candid. Well, his, his I understanding. read that book. I have that book. And then you yeah. wrote another one, the rebirth yeah. of the African civilization. Yeah. Powerful. Yeah, because yeah. he basically gave you a, a breakdown of what you can do differently, what it's going to take to do it. Yeah. And, and I said it depends on yeah. how serious we are in embracing those Correct. plans. Because he had a view from the bridge and mm -hmm. indicate exactly what's happening, mm -hmm. what are the problems and contradic contradictions. So I would say there's going to be some struggle and some difficult times, but we can move forward. We have shown a great resilience and been very valid yes. in uh, being able to maintain our humanity. Yes. And so this has been, it's, it's been inspiring, it's been uh, empowering, but we have a lot of work to do. So I would say that it will be years of, uh, of challenge, but we can meet the challenge. Uh, we may not necessarily, I mean, let's be honest, but I think that more likely than not, we will but there's no guarantees because folks have to put the work in. That's correct. That's exactly what it comes. And so as a historian, yes. you know, my work is to continue to lead and guide and challenge people's thinking. Yes. Because a lot of things that we think have nothing to do with reality. Right. So I bust up myths all the time when yes. people want to dine and bathe in slavery and right. who beat us up and who handed our behind to us on a platter as right. opposed to recognize, okay, wait a minute, those things happen. Let's look at the bigger picture right. as well so we can create solutions and not dwell on uh, 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 how big and bad the so-called demigod. He ain't no demigod. Right, right, you know, right. He's a doer of wicked practices and we need to be aware of it, but not dwell on that. That's correct. You know? I love that. I love what you've just said. Powerful. And, you know, you, oh, I'm so thankful for you today. And, I appreciate and, and, it. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, and you, you're in our community. This is one of our jewels, people. I'm out here in Oakland, people. So, um, and in a moment, I'm going to let you tell a little bit about what you do annually and taking everyone to commit to continue to see our greatness and to be able to know the truth about things that are occurring and changing rapidly. Um, but let me ask you first, if you would, um, can you finish this sentence? A people without knowledge of their history is 
a confused people. A confused people. Yes. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank you for that. It's a confused, and we see that every day. You know, we become a chameleon near anyone we stand around. You know, I'm around yes. you, I become like you here, there, everywhere. Confused. Very much. And I just wanted to say that this idea that people who've been around, they've heard this, that when in Rome, do as the Romans do. And I say that uh, never. never. The Romans had bad values. They were slave owners. They didn't respect women. They had a, a, a debauchery was common in the society. So when I'm in Rome, I'm May New and Pim the African. No matter where I'm at, whether I'm in Oakland, anywhere in the U.S., I've gone to a couple dozen countries around the world to do original research, and I've never changed my character at all. So wherever I'm at, in Rome or any other place in the world, I stand on the square of African culture, and nobody influences me differently. So if you meet somebody from any of those countries, guess what? It's the same May New and Pim, and nobody <laughs> will give you a strange story That's of correct. how I acted. That's correct. Because I'm always representing my family and the community and the race. That's right. Respect. Respect. So, um, so he makes us proud. You know, he makes us proud. Even if we, we're not practicing it, wherever he goes, he sets the record straight who we are as a people. And we thank you for that. You're welcome. So, I, I'll let you tell uh, about your tours uh, while I prepare to do a close with my poem. All right, appreciate it. Well, you know, I, I do a lot of field work in Africa, so I'm doing work. Uh, my main project right now is the origins of ancient Kush. So I do original field work, no grants or foundations, it's not associated with the college. It's my independent primary research, pretty much in Egypt, the Sudan, South Sudan, Ethiopia. That's my work. So when I'm not doing field work in those areas, I'm leading educational tours. So it's a 15-day educational tour to Kemet or so-called Egypt. And then Ethiopia is more stable now. So I'll be, I will resume leading the educational tours to Ethiopia as well. Whoa. So that's what we're doing in 2023 <laughs> and beyond. Oh, lovely. And I'm going to be on the next one. I will be on the next one. So, sir, I am so thanking you very much again for your presence here, warming the audience that are making my show uh, valuable, something to go to, because hopefully I, my goal is to do my part um, in, my, in our community and um, the world as a whole, because that's what the techie is good for, is taking us across the seas. But uh, I'm gonna close with my book Reading one of my poems, Truth and Light Are One, is the title of the book, Poetic Soul Food. And today I will be reading, Time is Ticking. Time is ticking. Can you hear it? The children are screaming. Can you hear them? A whole lot is changing. Can you feel it? It's a whole lot of unfair gaming. Must we all feel it? I have left nothing there. It's in truth that I find myself here, trying to discern who does and does not care. Time is ticking. Can you hear it? The children are screaming. Can you hear them? The time has come to speak treat, truth to freedom. No, my friend, there's no more hiding place for the heathens. The stage is set, if nothing else, all will darn their very best dress. It's an exceptional night, you see, my friend, for the best of best will stand in present tense. No need to adjust those Gucci lenses. Their titles are written all over their faces. Doctors and lawyers, accountants, let's face it, the best of the best, we deserve no less. Time is ticking. Can you hear it? The children are screaming. Can you hear them? What if our future now hanging in limbo? What if our facade now faded to fiction? To whom shall we plead for our very existence? To where shall we go to revive our true resistance? It's all coming down. It's all falling apart. It was vile from our start. It's the hellish thought that has distorted our very hearts. Can you hear it?
can you hear it? Can you hear it? Too good. Asheo, Asheo, another session of Let's Talk and Grow with Miss Mushuba. Please subscribe, share with a friend, thumbs up, and we'll meet again soon. Thank you again. You're welcome. All right, bless. Okay.